Welcome to Daniel Morgan Graduate School. My name is Frank Fletcher, Director of Lectures and Seminars. We're very pleased today to have with us Ambassador John Bolton. Introducing Ambassador Bolton will be our Vice President for External Affairs, Dr. Thomas Sinken, who had a distinguished career with the U.S. Department of State. We're very grateful to Dr. Sinken for inviting Ambassador Bolton here today. Dr. Sinken. Thank you, Frank. And um, I really have the genuine privilege and uh, pleasure to introduce uh, my friend and former colleague, Ambassador John Bolton, today. He is literally a man who needs no introduction, but given his distinguished career, he certainly deserves one. Um, just to make a few brief notes, um, I first met uh, John when he was our Assistant Secretary for International Organization Affairs, and he visited Tokyo to explain the then seemingly outlandish idea that the UN should not have redundant agencies or duplicative ones. Uh, we had one in Tokyo, as a matter of fact. It was the UN University. It had no faculty and no students, but it did have a lot of money. So um, I'm imagining how well this place would fare with no students and no faculty, but suffice it to say, uh, I think Ambassador Bolton had a great impact there. Um, probably um, we should all thank him for, among other things, coordinating the successful effort to rescind the United Nations resolution from the 70s that had equated Zionism with racism. I uh, next encountered Ambassador Bolton um, when he was Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, and I was Special Assistant to uh, Rich Armitage, who was our Deputy Secretary, and it was often my task to go around the corner and figure out what was going on and talk to Ambassador Bolton and his staff and try to uh, you know square things away from you know what I could do to be helpful, and um, I really enjoyed uh, those uh, talks with the Ambassador and his staff, and I like to think we had a very productive and uh, very friendly relationship. And um, later, as uh, ambassador to the United Nations, uh, Ambassador Bolton was, of course, very forthright in defending U.S. national security interests. Um, among the things that I remember, for example, taking a stand that uh, the uh, proposed UN Human Rights Council was kind of a hypocritical organization, and because there they were packing it, with the worst thuggish regimes on earth, um, and few wanted to say anything about it. But Ambassador Bolton was very forthright about it. I just give that as an example of his uh, courageous stances uh, in the name of what was correct. Um, now a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, I like to think that Ambassador Bolton's uh, philosophy can be summarized by the title of his famous book, Surrender is not an option. And so with that, I'd love to introduce to you uh, Ambassador John Bolton. Well, Tom, thank you very much. And uh, when Tom asked me to come and speak at some point, I was delighted to do it. Uh, as he described to you, he and I worked together on uh, many occasions in the State Department and uh, everything that he was able to accomplish during his career in the Foreign Service really it's uh, for many of you who uh, may be studying with the name at some point to uh, to join the State Department uh, he has enormous experience uh, and background I'm sure would be delighted to give you all the counsel that you need on it but it was especially uh, attractive to me to be able to speak to a new school uh, dealing with national security because uh, it really is uh, an opportunity for the faculty and the students, I think, to take a fresh look at um, a lot of the challenges we face internationally, some of the problems that uh, beset the United States and uh, the world community. So uh, what I thought I would try and do here today in a, a fairly brief period of time is talk about some of the challenges facing the Trump administration, uh, even though it's a little bit over a year now since President's uh, inauguration. Uh, it's still relatively new, and, and uh, the, the ways in which it's addressing some of these challenges, I think, uh, uh, is going to have significant impact uh, for a long, long time to come. I think the, 
So the most significant aspect of what the Trump administration uh, is looking at is that many of the challenges uh, and problems that it has to deal with are due bills from the inaction of prior administrations that are coming due on his watch. Uh, not problems that arose from uh, his policies, as would be the case for any new president, but consequences of uh, actions by prior administrations that he has to deal with. And I think uh, if you look at the administration's national security strategy, uh, that's one level of uh, abstraction of how they approach it. Uh, I don't want to go through that in any detail, but it's, it was interesting to me that uh, they at least break the problems down in a way similar to the way I try and look at things, current threats versus longer term threats. Uh, and, and it shows the, the really the full spectrum uh, of problems that the United States faces. This is a period very different than the Cold War when the threat was more identifiable. It might manifest itself in a variety of uh, particular ways, but, but this is a much more wide-ranging uh, series of challenges. And I, I think the two most immediate challenges that uh, the United States faces are the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological on the one hand, uh, and the continuing threat of international terrorism on the other. And the two more strategic or longer range challenges uh, I would characterize as Russia and India. Now, this is uh, obviously uh, a kind of forced simplification of a complex world. There are many other issues <clears throat> as well, but, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about those in the, in the question period. Excuse me. <coughs> But for now, uh, let me start off with the uh, uh, proliferation issue, because I do think that is the most significant. Um, we have seen over a period of 25 years in dealing both with North Korea uh, and Iran, uh, a variety of efforts by the different administrations to, thank you very much, to combine a, uh, a series of diplomatic actions and a series of economic sanctions uh, using both carrots and sticks, uh, as they say, uh, to try to resolve the problem of the uh, nuclear and ballistic missile programs of those two states. Uh, there, there were others as well that posed problems from time to time. Iraq was one of them. That ceased to be a problem uh, after the invasion in 2003. When people say, but what did you accomplish uh, other than the death of Saddam Hussein, which was a great boon to humanity, uh, it's the elimination of any possibility that Iraq uh, had a viable nuclear, chemical, or biological warfare program. But North Korea and Iran continued, and indeed continued in ways that uh, I think demonstrate the vitality of the metaphor axis of evil because we know that North Korea and Iran have cooperated for decades on ballistic missiles. Uh, their uh, objectives are the same, to use them as delivery vehicles for nuclear weapons. Uh, and there's every reason to believe they've cooperated on the nuclear uh, program as well. North Korea and Iran both uh, got their <coughs> uranium enrichment technology from AQ Khan, the Pakistani nuclear uh, entrepreneur. Uh, who stole that technology from Urenko and brought it to Pakistan to, to form one of the bases of Pakistan's nuclear weapons program. So on the critical uh, capability of uranium enrichment, they were using the same technology. And there'd be every incentive to cooperate and exchange uh, information about how to improve their centrifuge's performance. Uh, both Pakistan and Iran got their nuclear weapons design from AQ Khan. Uh, which Pakistan, in turn, got from China. Uh, we know this because when Muammar Gaddafi gave up uh, his pursuit of nuclear weapons in 2003 and 2004, he delivered the weapons plans that AQ Khan had sold to him and gave them to us, and they were written in Chinese. So it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good indication of uh, their source. So uh, this, this all goes to say that the efforts by uh, Iran and North Korea really need to be seen as uh, efforts proceeding in tandem. Um, and the consequence of failure by the United States 
potentially as early as this year in the case of North Korea, the failure to stop uh, these nuclear proliferation programs, uh, I think, could deal a fatal blow to 70 years of global effort to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. If a country as desperately poor as North Korea, uh, among the most heavily sanctioned on Earth, a country that's essentially a 25 million person prison camp, can develop deliverable nuclear weapons, that is a signal that anybody can deliver nuclear weapons if they only have enough patience. Uh, and in fact, North Korea, following the AQCon example, uh, would unquestionably be willing to sell its ballistic missile technology, its nuclear technology, to anybody with hard currency. That could be Iran, that could be a terrorist group like ISIS or Al-Qaeda, it could be another aspiring nuclear weapon state. Now, how close are we to North Korea making this breakthrough? You know, we have the public statement just recently of CIA Director Mike Pompeo, who has described North Korea as being uh, a handful of months away from that capability. And what he means is not, can they set off a nuclear device? We know they can. They've done it six times, the last one being a thermonuclear weapon. The question is, can they fashion the device into a warhead size, put it on the top of an ICBM, launch it into a ballistic trajectory headed toward a target in the United States, send it out of the atmosphere, bring the reentry vehicle back into the atmosphere, get it to the target they're aiming at, and detonate it at the right altitude. Uh, and, and that's what he means by being a handful of months away. So there's not a lot of time here. People say uh, in wake of the uh, Olympics, the Winter Olympics in South Korea, but look at the wonderful atmosphere of cooperation because the North Korean and South Korean Olympic teams march together because the women's ice hockey team is uh, competing together and so on. Uh, Kim Jong-un's sister came to the games. Uh, look, uh, this is a pure propaganda stunt and uh, uh, you can see today as the story unfolds that Vice President Pence was prepared to meet with uh, Kim Jong-un's sister uh, and uh, North Koreans called it off at the last moment. Uh, that uh, their response to uh, the U.S. revealing this uh, was that the North Korean uh, news agency, uh, KCNA, today called Vice President Pence human scum. Um, I congratulate him on that. They've called me human scum, too. I'm glad he made it up to my level. Uh, and so th this, is, this is the nature of the regime that we're dealing with. But the point is they're very close. And to say, well, let's have more negotiation ignores the fact that negotiation, <clears throat> like every other human activity, has costs as well as benefits. Uh, in the proliferation area, the cost of negotiation is the loss of time. Uh, almost invariably, time is an asset that the would-be proliferator needs. Time to overcome the scientific and technological obstacles to achieving deliverable nuclear weapons. Uh, and so when you negotiate without uh, imposing any cost on the other side, uh, their centrifuges are spinning, their rocket scientists are working away, uh, they're making progress, we're not. Uh, and there's a further, I think, historical fact here. We've tried negotiation in one way or another off and on with North Korea for 25 years, and it has failed. Uh, what hope is there in year 26 that you're going to get a different result. I understand why there's an argument to continue to try to negotiate, but after year 15 or 16 or 17, you'd think people would begin to get a little bit discouraged. By year 25, uh, you should be prepared to say, you know, we have tried, honestly, we have tried. Uh, if you go back and look at the negotiating record at Pan Munjom in the armistice during the Korean War, to read the notes taken by the American negotiators, uh, you can see that North Korea's negotiating style was developed very early. Uh, there's one incident, I just, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it surprises me to this day when I think about it. In the afternoon of one negotiating session, the American uh, lead uh, delegate was so frustrated, he finally said, all right, let's take the suggestion you made this morning to do X. All right, I accept it. The North Korean rejected it. 
because by that time they had moved on to something else. That, that's what it's like uh, in negotiations that are not going anywhere. So I think we're down to a very difficult situation with North Korea. As I say, the Trump administration inherited this, but it's going to have to make the final decision. Absent some dramatic development by China, uh, either to uh, move dispositively against the regime in North Korea, to consider the prospect of reunification as a second alternative, or something else, uh, North Korea is very close to the point where they can hit the United States with a nuclear weapon. Now, if we're prepared to live with that, uh, that's uh, an alternative some have accepted. Susan Rice, the uh, President Obama's national security advisor, said she could live with it. I think that's a mistake. I don't think that uh, policies of containment and deterrence that worked during the Cold War worked with a regime like this or with a regime like Iran. Frankly, it's not like the deterrent structures of the Cold War were all that stable to begin with. Uh, I can see there are many in this room who didn't live through it. Uh, you probably don't know what duck and cover drills are. I hope you never have to learn. Uh, uh, but in any event, whatever the outcome in the Cold War, the regimes in Pyongyang and Tehran, I think, don't have the same calculus that the Soviets did. Uh, and in any event, we are really now talking about living in a multipolar nuclear world, not in the bipolar standoff of the Cold War. So anybody who says that in a multipolar world, deterrence works the same as it did during the Cold War is simply speculating. We've never experienced a multipolar nuclear world of the sort we may be about to enter. Uh, and really, to me, it's this, uh, the imminence of uh, North Korea potentially crossing the finish line that colors my view of Iran. I, I think the Iran nuclear deal that President Obama signed in 2015 was a strategic mistake for the United States. Uh, I think they are violating it. I don't think they've ever given up their aspirations to get nuclear weapons. Certainly their broader international behavior has not changed as was predicted if we only relieve them of the concern about uh, hostile American intent. Uh, they'll become a more uh, responsible player in international affairs. That obviously has not happened. Look at what they're doing now in the wake of the defeat of the ISIS caliphate. Uh, but really all of that pales into insignificance when you realize that whatever uh, technology North Korea has today, Iran can have tomorrow by writing a large enough check. How does that work? You have a relatively rich nation that wants that technology, dealing with a desperately poor nation that has that technology, this is not a hard transaction to structure. So uh, we've got some very hard decisions coming on nuclear proliferation. Uh, and uh, we've got them coming uh, perhaps at a time when uh, we wish they uh, weren't in front of us, but the technology has moved on to the point I think it's unavoidable. Uh, and in many respects, uh, the continuing threat of international terrorism really uh, uh, raises this prospect of a perfect storm of terrorist groups coming into possession, even if not nuclear weapons, chemical or biological weapons, programs we think both Iran and North Korea have. The collapse of the ISIS caliphate, the territorial caliphate, uh, unfortunately has given Iran the prospect of having a, an arc of control extending from their own territory through the portions of Iraq controlled by the Baghdad government, which is today effectively a satellite of Iran, uh, linking up with the Assad regime in Syria and the Hezbollah terrorist in uh, Lebanon. The Arab, uh, the oil producing monarchies of the peninsula, Jordan, Egypt, all terribly concerned about this uh, strategic shift. Israel, obviously, very concerned. Uh, uh, and I don't think at this point we have an adequate strategy to deal with it. Iran has never ceased its role as the world's largest financier of international terrorism, the central banker of terrorism. Uh, Sunni, Shia, it doesn't matter to them if they're uh, hostile to the West, uh, they can find funding in Tehran. So, uh, you know, we worry quite properly about uh, North Korea and Iran's ballistic missile capability, but let's be clear, you can take a relatively primitive nuclear device, put it in the hold of a tramp steamer, and sail it into any harbor in the world. Uh, you can dismantle a crude nuclear device, bring it across the Mexican border, put it in the basement of a building, 
in any city in the United States. There are lots of ways, uh, in, uh, in, unfortunately, that, uh, that these devices can be used. So the continuing terrorist threat uh, combined with the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, as I say, today these remain to me the primary immediate threats for the United States and its friends and allies, but, uh, but they tie in as well to the larger strategic threat. And uh, we might as well start with Russia. What, what have they been up to recently? Well, they've been trying to subvert our elections. Let's, let's start there. Uh, this, is, uh, this is nothing new uh, for Russia. I think it's, I uh, wrote an op-ed, uh, in fact, uh, it was published on Monday, that said, I think uh, that this is actually now a perfect time for President Trump to pivot to make it clear that he's not going to permit additional Ru Russian meddling or meddling by any other foreign government in our electoral process. <laughs> the special counsel's indictment on Friday of 13 Russian nationals with no allegations of collusion by the Trump campaign I think shows that uh, what the Russians were up to was trying to sow mistrust and discord uh, in the American body politic, and that their ads for or against different candidates were means to an end and not an end in itself. Um, and I think this is, uh, uh, this is whether, whether you think they were trying to collude with the Trump campaign or trying to collude with the Clinton campaign, their interference is unacceptable. It's an attack, really, on the American Constitution. Uh, and I think this is, uh, the President's been worried about his political liability. I think the Mueller indictment removes that cloud substantially. It's not the final word, that's for sure. But it uh, really does allow him to act uh, in a much more positive way to prevent uh, the Russians from continuing this activity, to establish conditions of deterrence, uh, to convince them and others that they will pay a substantial price if they try it in the future. So. Whatever they did in the 2016 election, I think we should respond to in cyberspace and elsewhere. I don't think the response should be proportionate. I think it should be very disproportionate because deterrence works when you convince your adversary that they will pay an enormous cost for imposing cost on you. And that's what causes them to say, we're not even going to think about it. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, we all make the mistake of thinking we live in the most uh, important time and this Russian interference is new if you go back, go back as far as you want. Uh, I, I've tried recently to use the example of Ronald Reagan, whose first real involvement in politics was when he was trying to prevent communists from taking over the Screen Actors Guild in Hollywood. Now, why would the Communist Union want to dominate the Screen Actors Guild? because it was a means of communication and in information dissemination for the American people. You could shape people's attitudes if you controlled the movies. Uh, and so uh, Facebook may not be Hollywood in the 1940s, but as a communications device, they're still doing the same thing. They're just technologically updated. Uh, and I think it goes uh, with other Russian actions uh, in the past several years. Uh, they've obviously uh, threatened and indeed acted <clears throat> in the space of the former Soviet Union uh, and against Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, back in 2006, when he was uh, last president, um, Vladimir Putin said the breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, which showed pretty much what, what he thought his actions in office when he came back would be, which was to reassert Russian hegemony within the space of the former Soviet Union. I think most Americans believe the breakup of, uh, of the USSR was a good way to end the 20th century. That was obviously not Putin's view, and he's trying to reverse it in Ukraine uh, and in Georgia. Uh, he's now carved out uh, pieces of their territory. He's occupying uh, parts of uh, eastern Ukraine, even though he hasn't annexed them like he did the Crimea. Uh, violating a principle we and the Europeans laid down in 1945 that we would no longer accept territorial changes in Europe based on military force. That's what the Russians have accomplished, unanswered, basically, so far. Uh, so Putin has been extending Russian influence, uh, and frankly, he has not yet met effective opposition. And until he does, he'll just continue to try uh, and probe and, and look for weakness. 
Russia has done the same in the Middle East. You know, in the past few years, Russia has gained uh, a prominence in that region that it hasn't had since the 1970s when Anwar Sadat uh, expelled the Soviet military advisors from Egypt, uh, took Egypt out of the Russian orbit, brought it into the Western orbit, and gave us the conditions that ultimately led to the Camp David peace agreement in uh, 1978, which has been the bipartisan foundation stone of American uh, policy in the Middle East ever since. Russia is now selling weapons again to Egypt. It's selling to Saudi Arabia. Uh, within the past few years, it's built a major air base at Latakia in Syria just a few minutes flying time from Israel's northern border. In December, the State Duma voted to uh, expand the naval station at Tardis, a few miles away from Latakia, very significantly. Now, it's not just that Russia has these two bases in Syria, it's what it says about them. These are the only two Russian military facilities in the world outside the territory of the former Soviet Union. So th these are very significant. And this Russian penetration of the Middle East has had uh, very significant consequences. The continued uh, existence of the Assad regime in uh, Syria is a good example of it, uh, as well as being representative of the uh, implicit alliance between Russia and Iran uh, that poses a real threat uh, across the Middle East, as I previously described. Uh, th this is why the notion that the Russians can help us with terrorism, I think, is ultimately uh, delusional because uh, they're aligned with the world's uh, most important finance, uh, financier of terrorism. So the Middle East remains in uh, grave trouble. It's enormously complicated, uh, and, uh, and America still doesn't have, I think, a coherent strategy, certainly not a coherent post-ISIS strategy to deal with Russia as well as with Iran. Uh, turning to China, you know, uh, in the UN, Russia and China fly wingman for each other. So when we talk about the Iran nuclear weapons program, the Russians tend to be Iran's defender and China supports them. When we talk about the North Korean nuclear weapons program, China is their protector uh, and Russia uh, helps them out. And uh, they've got a de facto territorial division of labor in the world. China is uh, moving very aggressively uh, to take over the South China Sea uh, and to pose risks in the East China Sea. You know, China's already declared the South China Sea to be a province of China. They have a provincial capital. Uh, they, uh, they are, you know, in the Middle East we talk about facts on the ground. China's not got uh, just facts on the ground in the South China Sea, it's making the ground and it's building air and naval bases on top of them to demonstrate their control. I think without uh, effective American resistance, the countries of ASEAN, the Southeast Asian countries, uh, obviously don't have the strength to deal with China individually, uh, and I don't think we provided adequate leadership. I think the threat in the East China Sea is not uh, nearly so brave, uh, unless you happen to live on Taiwan, and then you're very worried about uh, what may be going on. And it's not confined uh, to those two bodies of water either. The Chinese have embarked on a massive program to map the entire undersea of the Indian Ocean, to know exactly what the topography on the ocean floor is. Now, among other reasons you do this, of course, is fishing, and that's, their, that's one of the stated rationales. It's also good to know where the undersea mountains are so you can hide your ballistic missile submarines from detection by intrusive navies like the United States. Right now, China and India are engaged in a face-off over the Maldive Islands, uh, where China would love to have naval facilities, and where India is just as determined that they not get them. Uh, this, this really is the clash of the 21st century uh, between India and China and that part of the world. And you know they don't call Southeast Asia Indochina for nothing. That, that is where uh, the confrontation may well occur. But China's, China's uh, advances are obviously much more extensive as well. We know they have uh, one of the world's most effective cyber warfare programs. I could give you a lot of examples of that. Just the most striking here in Washington is uh, a couple of years ago, 
They apparently extracted 20 million personnel records from the Office of Personnel Management, government employees. So Tom and, and my personnel files are now in Beijing somewhere. I hope they enjoy reading them. Um, uh, and for many other people who, uh, for whom all that sensitive information uh, is now available. China's in, engaged in a significant military buildup. They're building a blue water Navy for the first time in 600 years. Think about that for a minute, 600 years. They've got an aggressive anti-satellite program to destroy our overhead capabilities. They're modernizing and reorganizing the People's Liberation Army. They've got uh, area denial and anti-access technology uh, to push the American Navy back from the Western Pacific, where we have been the, the uh, dominant stabilizing force since of World War II and a host of, host of other developments as well. So we basically have no China strategy. Uh, we've got a lot of concerns, but uh, for many years, really uh, getting on to uh, two decades now, we have not had an effective China strategy. Uh, I think the Chinese plan and act in very long range way, I wish we uh, had that capability, but in any event, we've got to do what we can or we will simply be outmaneuvered time and time again. Now on these strategic issues, uh, of course, they, they will last well beyond the Trump administration, but in the absence of effective decision making for the past 10 or 15 years, uh, the decisions that, uh, that they're going to make will have uh, really enormous consequences going forward. So I think we live in very challenging times internationally. I think this is a great time to be studying national security. So congratulations to all of you for being here and doing that. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I have a microphone here, so um, let's uh, begin. That was an excellent overview. Um, I have a question about the Chinese uh, spy, I've just read recently about their spy rings in universities here, and I wondered if you could comment on that. Well, there have been a number of reports about, about what they're doing uh, through uh, the Confucius Institutes and a range of things like that, um, and uh, I think we're just hearing about the, uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg about what their efforts are. Uh, you know, this is a, uh, uh, I think, a very concerted effort. Uh, we know from commercial experience uh, that when American or European firms establish, for example, manufacturing facilities in China, uh, that whatever technology you install in the factory, you will find soon enough in a Chinese factory down the road. Uh, their fifth generation uh, fighter plane uh, looks a lot like the F-35 uh, because they got bits and pieces of its technology. Uh, and I think that, uh, that the, the issue of uh, uh, piracy of intellectual property in the commercial world is probably the top uh, issue on the list of trade disputes between the United States and Europe and China. So it would be perfectly natural to see a significant increase in Chinese espionage. I say natural, not acceptable, but natural but also efforts to learn more about the United States and its culture to be able to influence it more. Russians aren't the only ones who can conduct social media warfare. Uh, this is not to say that uh, uh, we should be restricting Chinese students coming to the United States. I can tell you as, a, uh, as an alumnus of the U.S. Agency for International Development, I think the most effective American foreign aid programs uh, amount to bringing <coughs> foreigners to the United States putting them in our graduate schools and universities, and exposing them to the country for, for, its, for everything that's good about it and everything that's bad about it. Uh, they can make their own judgments based on that. So I think, I think we've got plenty to, uh, to show here, but let, let's be clear, the, the, the selection process for many of the people coming from China is not the spontaneous view of students they'd love to come here. They're, they're following orders and they've been Pre-selected, so there's there's a lot we don't know uh, to be sure, and I think we uh, we have to see what else is out there. I had a question about 
companies, corporations in the past, uh, British Petroleum would be very helpful to the intelligence community, or Pan Am would quote unquote have an executive in Russia, but they were doing other things. Uh, do you see us working more closely with companies, and how would you encourage the students to prepare for that type of work? I'm just thinking of them as the future leaders. Yeah. Well, I think uh, it's very important for uh, national security generally that decision makers in Washington have the best available information on conditions in any given country. And you can get that in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, it's not just through uh, uh, gathering intelligence uh, uh, in clandestine fashion. Much of what State Department uh, officers do overseas is reporting. Uh, and it may be what you can learn by walking down the street, it may be from people in the media, it comes from a hundred different sources, but political officers or economic officers nonetheless have to sift through it all and digest it, weigh what's credible with what's not credible and report it back to Washington. So intelligence is valuable, but unless you have what they call open source materials, the intelligence can be disproportionate. And I think, uh, uh, Tom and others would agree, there's, there's, there's really a, no better source in helping to get a perspective from the U.S. side uh, about events in a, in a foreign country than to hear what U.S. business people who regularly deal with a broad array of people in the country think. Th this isn't doing something nefarious when you talk about your experiences in a country. It's helping the United States better understand it. Uh, it may be your information will help facilitate better relations with that country, which will mean more business for your company. Uh, but that's, uh, you, can, you can bet that, uh, that uh, executives from foreign companies do that all the time. Uh, and I think in, in most cases, uh, uh, American companies welcome as well. Now look, a lot of companies these days are completely transnational. My daughter works for Nissan, but, but uh, she's an American too. And, uh, so it doesn't really matter where you work, it's just being helpful to your government in understanding better what's going on around the world. Raymond Tanter, the American Committee on Human Rights and the Iran Policy Committee. Uh, Pastor Bowden, you made reference to North Korea's uh, cyber capabilities. And one of the things, one of the, que the question I have is, what do you think of uh, hacking into North Korea's oil reserve compute software, because most of the oil that China sends to North Korea goes under the ground in North Korea. And if you could collaborate with China, maybe even Russia, on hacking into the oil reserves software, that would send a message to North Korea that, that would go well beyond any kind of pressure uh, overt pressure that would be exploited by, um, that would be uh, as a result of the Chinese. And, and lastly, uh, I just finished a piece on Iran hacking capabilities, and they hacked into the protesters' um, apps. And that was one of the reasons why the Iranian protest w went down or uh, declined. So the question mainly has to do with the North Korea and the oil. Well, I think there, that's a good example of uh, steps that can be taken below uh, use of force directly. Uh, and uh, I have a feeling that we're doing all kinds of things that we don't know about because that's what, you know, if you're undertaking clandestine activity, I hope it remains clandestine at least until it's succeeded. And, and the same is true in the case of Iran. And, there are other actors in, uh, in Iran as well. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it's just a reality that cyberspace is a, is a new territory for, uh, for operations, for whether it's communication, uh, all the way up to, to use in, uh, in armed conflict. And I think, and I, I said this several years ago, and I don't, I don't know that there's been much progress made, but you know, we've got to have a conceptual framework for cyberspace like we do for nuclear weapons so that we can distinguish between uh, activity that's just nuisance, that's, you know, 
hate to say it, graduate students who uh, don't have anything to do on a Saturday night having, having fun with somebody else's computer system, that's kind of one level. Second level is kind of, I'll call it routine, it's not the right word, routine commercial uh, skullduggery, theft, and that sort of thing. It's a slightly greater level of problem. Uh, up to, uh, you know, intelligence gathering is the next level, clandestine operations is the next level, and actual hostilities. It would be the use of force if you were using kinetic capabilities. So what, what when we say cyber attack, is it intelligence gathering? Is it uh, designed to take out a computer system and make it inoperable? Uh, or is it something uh, perhaps being used as a precursor or together with uh, active use of military force. And that escalation ladder, conceptually, uh, would then help us say, well, what's your response to it? And what should your defenses be? Uh, rather than say, just because North Korea hacks Sony pictures, uh, you know, to me, not a very sympathetic target, but that's, that's, that's just my bias is showing. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Hollywood, you know, that's, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe they wanted more movies in Pyongyang, I don't know. But, but look, that, that caused uh, so many significant damage, there's no doubt about it. And um, maybe we've retaliated, maybe we haven't. But, but, but we have to understand what the matrix is before we simply lash out again. Uh, and also to know what we can do proactively. And here I'm coming to your question about Iran. Uh, you know, from all that we can tell, the demonstrations all across Iran at the end of the year broke out spontaneously. There have been demonstrations in Iran for years protesting economic conditions, not in Tehran, but out in the country. And they just haven't been reported widely in the American press. Uh, but I think those demonstrations really crossed the red line inside Iran. They weren't protesting the stealing of the election, uh, as in uh, 2013. They were, they were, they were, pro they were protesting uh, 2009, rather, 2009. they were protesting uh, the regime itself. And they were calling for an end of the regime, death to Khamenei, and uh, really going directly into the existential question of who should rule in Iran. So I think the regime was extraordinarily frightened by that. I think they struck back in a variety of ways. Uh, and we effectively did very little, if, if anything, uh, to help them out, help the demonstrators out. So dealing with the counter communication strategy of a government like Iran uh, is something we could provide uh, to the opposition in Iran and other countries. So that's another aspect of uh, cyberspace that we, we need to think through uh, more carefully. And, and we are to an extent, I just, uh, my judgment would be we're way behind uh, conceptually and operationally China, Russia, uh, North Korea, maybe others. Your colleague at AEI, Dan Blumenthal, recently introduced the concept of maximum pressure on North Korea, which would involve secondary sanctions on Chinese entities and businesses doing business with the regime. How would this, could this fit? How could it be conceived that those fit into a broader China approach if we had one? Well, I think uh, uh, Dan and I are good friends and have worked together on a number of things, and I think his idea reflects uh, the correct view that sanctions on North Korea alone have obviously failed. Uh, and, and I might say that that was Susan Rice's conclusion. I mentioned her view of, she, she quite candidly confessed 25 years of diplomacy have failed. She got that right for a change. Uh, but, but, uh, but the question then of how you bring China along or, or how you impose additional pressure on North Korea I think is more complicated. Uh, to really impose pain on China, you would need sweeping economic sanctions. Uh, individual pinprick sanctions on this bank or that person are not going to be enough. But to put real economic pressure on China would cause economic pain here, too. So for example, a sanction that said uh, no Chinese participation in the American financial system has, whoa, sit up and take notice force. But do you think the banks in New York would say, sure, we're good with that? 
it's, it's not going to happen. In other words, the, the difficulty of economic sanctions, and believe me, I've been through this in a lot of different capacities in the government. They're certainly preferable to actual military force, but the number of times when they've been successful historically is very small, very small. Uh, so that has led me thinking about this over time to wonder if instead of trying to pressure China on North Korea, we can appeal to China's national interest, which I think ultimately is the way to get anybody's attention. Uh, and so rather than try and pressure China and fail, my argument would be, look, you've said for 25 years you don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons because you feel it would destabilize Northeast Asia and that would be disadvantageous to Chinese economic development. That, that's been their stated position. They're right about that. They're absolutely right about that. Now, of course, there's a code there. When they say destabilizing and detrimental to their economic growth, they're talking about Japan getting nuclear weapons. That's what they're talking about. Uh, if I were China, I wouldn't want Japan to have nuclear weapons either. Uh, so the, the uh, approach to China ought to be, we take you at your word that it's in your national interest uh, not to have North Korea achieve that capability. Uh, there are several things we could do that you should think about. One, replace the current regime with another one uh, and allow uh, a joint program to extract all the nuclear and ballistic, te ballistic missile technology we can. Or, uh, my preference would be, let's have a controlled implosion of North Korea uh, so that, in effect, we reunite the Korean Peninsula under South Korean leadership. Now, many people would say, well, the Chinese are not going to accept that because they want North Korea as a buffer zone. Uh, but honestly, if it ever came to hostility between the United States and China, we're not going to conveniently invade China through North Korea. You know, it's going to happen somewhere else. That's a backwater. It, it, it is not a buffer zone in any meaningful way. What the Chinese really fear, I, I think, is two things. Number one, that a collapse of the regime in North Korea, which would be the uh, predecessor step to reunification, would result in a flood of Korean refugees into China, and uh, they want to avoid that. Uh, and they're quite right to be concerned about it. I mean, there are reports now that they're setting up refugee camps on their side of the Yalu River because they're worried that's about to happen. South Korea doesn't want to flood of refugees into South Korea either. Uh, there's a way to work together to prevent that from happening. Uh, but the second thing the Chinese fear with a, with a precipitous reunification of Korea uh, is American troops on the Yalu River. Uh, and they saw that movie in 1950 and they didn't like it then and they don't like it any better today. Well, there's a good answer to that. We don't want to be on the Yalu River either for the same reason we don't want to be on the 38th parallel. Uh, right now we're strung out in a defensive line, our troops are not maneuverable, and they're highly vulnerable. I mean, they're targets. Uh, what we would like would be to move them all back to Pusan so they'd be maneuverable around Asia. Now, China won't like that either, but you know, life is hard. You don't get everything you want. We can commit not to be on the Yalu River. That should make them happy, makes us happy. So there are answers here. I'm not saying this is easy. I wish we had started this discussion 15 years ago. But that's the way to do it, I think. To, to say to China, your national interest should lead you to the conclusion you want to see reunification uh, and see what might happen. Do you have another question over here? Thank you very much. Uh, I think you laid out a really clear-eyed description of the problem with North Korea getting the capability to strike the United States with a nuclear tipped ICBM. And, uh, you said that you just said that you know the administration is going to have a decision to make. I'm wondering if you can take that one step further and uh, say, do you believe that um, the United States should launch a preemptive or preventive, whichever you want to you want to call it, strike on North Korea to prevent that from happening? And if so, how do you deal with the sort of risks of that approach, including you know, damage to South Korea, to the alliance, regional instability, economic instability, et cetera? Yeah. Well, look, I wish we weren't at this point. I mean, I wish we weren't at this point. Uh, if you read Henry Kissinger's memoirs, and I forget which of the three volumes it's in, so you're going to have to read all of them, but at one point in the, in the memoirs, he says that the real essence of statesmanship is identifying a threat as early as possible and dealing with it then. 
because if you deal with it in its incipiency, you don't have to deal with it when it becomes palpable. Uh, and that is the lesson, I think, for both North Korea and Iran. But, you know, okay, great, lesson learned, what are we going to do today? Um, the, the, the absent some dramatic action by China, we're facing essentially a binary choice, which is A, they get deliverable nuclear weapons, <clears throat> they are a constant threat, uh, and they have the capability of selling to others. So that the threat is not uh, localized to Northeast Asia, it's a global threat. That's one possibility. Uh, the other is we take preventive steps uh, uh, before, before they reach that point. Now, uh, there are any number of variations that have been suggested, uh, and you know they all have their merits and demerits. The concern is <clears throat> whether you preemptively strike the ballistic missile in nuclear facilities, whether it's uh, a decapitation strike, whether it's looking at them cross-eyed. The risk factor is what North Korea's reaction is. And it may be that even the hint of hostilities produces the maximum retaliatory response. And that is attacking the northern suburbs of Seoul. Let's just stop there for a minute. Here's a regime who bases its survival, uh, its defense against a preemptive strike, on the theory they're going to kill civilians. That's what they think today. What are they going to think when they get the nuclear capability? You know, it's not going to get prettier. It's going to get worse. So uh, in terms of destroying <coughs> the nuclear ballistic missile sites that we know of, the submarine bases, I think you have to destroy those to prevent them from getting a sea launched capability that we couldn't detect uh, uh, if you could get the submarine out of port. Uh, I, I think that's entirely doable. The, the two risks are, one, we don't know every location, uh, although with enough overhead, if any other new location developed, I think we could eliminate it quickly. The real problem is all that artillery uh, and mortars and missiles massed on the northern side of the demilitarized zone aimed at Seoul. Now, uh, I've, I've, I've been looking at this problem for 25 years, and uh, there's no blinking at the risk and the danger involved. And I don't mean to minimize it, I don't want to be heard to minimize it, but I will say this. Uh, I think our Air Force believes, and they are always optimist, they believe they can destroy that capability with minimal risk to South Korea. Uh, and they say it for a number of reasons, but perhaps the most important reason is all of the tunnels, all of the bunkers, all of the protection for the North Korean artillery was built before MOABs and MOPs, the massive ordnance airburst and the massive ordnance penetrators. Uh, and if you basically flatten everything uh, in that area, you would certainly minimize the downside risk. Now, I think that the consequences and you would do that simultaneously with destroying the ballistic missile and nuclear facilities. I think the consequence of such a strike would be the collapse of the North Korean government. Uh, and I think the, con the, co the consequence of the collapse would be the United States and South Korea go into North Korea to secure the nuclear sites just to make sure nothing has, has broken free. And five million North Korean refugees cross the Alu and Tumen rivers into China. Just why part of my argument to China would be, look, we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. Because if we have to go into North Korea, we're not going to withdraw. So it's, uh, I, I don't want to be at this place. I don't like this place. But I will tell you this, the primary duty of the president is to protect American citizens. And against the threat of a regime <laughs> run by a person who has killed his brother, by having women rub sarin gas on his face in the, the Malaysia airport, who has ordered one general killed by uh, dispatching feral hogs to eliminate him, and who has killed another general by lowering anti-aircraft artillery to horizontal point-blank range, isn't somebody I want with a nuclear capability. Another question back here. Um, another. Thanks. Uh, thank you for a very interesting um, discussion this morning. So one question that, that I have, and, and it sort of covers two areas, but some of the things that you said are, that were prescriptional were sort of directly opposed, at least by candidate Trump. 
during the election. You said that counting on Russia to, to help with terrorism was delusional. Yet that was, it appeared to be uh, candidate Trump's um, position. So how do we get, how, where, what is the prescription for the administration in both Syria to deal with both the strategic area, you have the ISIS issue, and then of course you have the Iranian um, and the Israeli thing now, which is its own set of um, uh, parameters. Right. Well, I don't. I don't think the administration has dealt strategically with the Middle East. And uh, look, it's a hard question. And in, in most administrations, when they get something like that, it goes in not the inbox or the outbox. It goes in the too hard to handle box. Uh, Which and is I why where we are with Korea. And well, that's one reason why after 25 years all these due bills are coming due. I mean, I think that's, uh, that's a honest assessment of it. Uh, you know, I think the administration made a mistake uh, at the beginning by continuing to follow the Obama administration's approach to dealing with ISIS. They did make some changes. They changed the rules of engagement. I think that was significant uh, in terms of allowing more American involvement. Uh, but they continued to support the Baghdad government's military forces and the Shia militia, both of which are effectively controlled by Tehran. So that it was certainly, there's no doubt, eliminating the territorial caliphate was an important priority, and I think that's essentially been accomplished. Uh, but we did it through aiding the Kurds. Uh, we should have done more to aid other Arab states to get involved and, and rely less on Iraq, because I think the consequence of the approach that was being followed by Obama, that was continued by Trump, has enhanced the Baghdad government and therefore enhanced Iran's strength all across the region. Um, and it, had we had a strategic rethinking right at the beginning, in my view, we wouldn't have done that. Iran was thinking of the next conflict, next possible conflict, and we were not. So uh, there's a lot going on in the region. I've, I've only described a few pieces of it. But, uh, but it does require a more comprehensive approach than we've got right now. And uh, given that there's not much time, I think, before the conditions worsen, uh, uh, it, it's, it's certainly something I hope they come up with. We, we have um, about five minutes left. I'd like to go quickly. And I have some people I promised. Um, so. We're going to try to go very quickly with short questions. Right, short sure answers. Right. <laughs> That's what you mean. <laughs> go ahead. Could you expand on the national security challenges coming from Afghanistan, especially that it has a proximity with India, Pakistan, which is a potential nuclear flashpoint? Yeah. Look, I think uh, American people are very frustrated that we're still in Pakistan. They talk about, at least Nancy Pelosi talks about America's longest war. Why are we still there? We're still there because there's a need to be there. You can either deal with Taliban and ISIS and Al-Qaeda uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the regions that they control inside Afghanistan, or you can deal with them here and in Europe. Uh, it's unpalatable. We didn't start this war. We don't want this war. But one side doesn't get to say, OK, we're tired of it. I think it's over. That's the way it works. Uh, I don't think we want Taliban to retake control of uh, Afghanistan, although they're making progress toward that end. Uh, because we don't want it to be a base to launch terrorist attacks against the United States like they did in 2001. I think there's another reason, perhaps even more compelling now, that we don't talk about enough, and that is that if Afghanistan were controlled by radicals of whatever variety, uh, it would inevitably strengthen the hand of the radicals inside Pakistan, uh, which already control the military's uh, intelligence uh, wing, uh, and, uh, and are an increasing threat across the officer corps. If Pakistan, with a, an arsenal that publicly has been estimated to be 60 to 200 nuclear weapons, were to fall into the hands of radicals, uh, you would have Iran on steroids right now. And so <clears throat> that's dangerous to India, number one, but it's dangerous to the rest of the world, more importantly, because the risk of Pakistan selling or transferring uh, nuclear devices to, uh, to terrorist groups, I think, would be uh, a, a very real uh, concern. So uh, I just think Americans have to be more patient about this. Uh, it's costly in terms of American lives. There's a lot of dissatisfaction with the Afghan performance over the years. We're obviously in difficulty in our relationships with Pakistan. The administration just cut off a significant uh, chunk of aid there. 
Uh, it's been a difficult relationship for a long time. I was first in Pakistan in 1982, and the circumstances have changed, but the questions are just as hard, maybe harder now than they were then. Uh, but that's, that's why, that's the long answer to the American people on why we're still fighting in Afghanistan. We have a question here. Uh, I would like to ask you a question regarding the military action against North Korea. I don't think China wants it any more than we do. If we, the president was willing to call in the Air Force in the last minute, don't you think China would give up? Well, I but I mean, you have to be serious. So far, they know we don't want it. They have to know that we want it. Yeah. Well, I think um, realistically, we're a long way from a military strike. We have not taken the steps that you would need to take. Uh, in preparation for it. We, we, can, we can attack from huge distances, but what we would need is a continuous uh, air presence over North Korea, and that means moving a lot of assets to Guam and Japan. By the way, I think Japan would be entirely supportive of a military strike. This is the most significant decision for Japan since World War II. I think they would be uh, supportive of us. Uh, but it also means talking to China. And uh, Secretary Tillerson, I guess about a month before Christmas, uh, I, think, I think I can say he let slip that the American military and the Chinese military were in conversation about the prospect of uh, some kind of hostilities on the Korean Peninsula. That's the best news I had heard in a long time. Because ultimately, we do have to make it very clear to China we have no aspiration whatever to cause them problems. We have a mutual interest uh, in making sure that North Korea doesn't send half of its population into its neighboring countries. Uh, and, and we want to de-conflict with China uh, uh, whatever way we need to uh, if we have to act. I would like to find a way to convince the Chinese to do this with us, to have a controlled collapse of the North Korean regime. China can do a, a number of things that we can't. For example, offering nice villas by the sea, for about 25 North Korean generals and their families and just uh, extract them from the country. There are other things that China could do as well. Uh, we're, we're racing the clock here. Again, if we had started this years ago, I think we'd have uh, much better prospects for success. I don't underestimate how difficult it is. Uh, but now we face, uh, to come back to what Mike Pompeo said, a problem of time, a handful of months before North Korea is ready. Uh, so it's, uh, we don't really have a lot of time, and that, that is another factor, obviously, limiting uh, our options. We have two, time for two more questions, this gentleman here, and then one more. I was wondering if you could uh, offer some comment on the decision of the current administration to recognize the decisions of past administrations to move the embassy in uh, Israel to Jerusalem. Well, I supported that. I testified uh, uh, before the House Oversight Committee in favor of it a couple weeks before he did it. Uh, I thought if, if you read the text of the President's announcement, it's very carefully uh, crafted. Uh, it does not reflect any change in America's view that final status issues for Jerusalem remain to be negotiated. Uh, nobody has ever contended that I'm aware that areas west of the Green Line, the Armistice Line, were ever going to be anything other than Israel. That's where the embassy is going to be. Uh, it does not reflect the change in our view that ultimately the parties have to themselves have to work it out. Um, and so I don't think it tilts uh, in favor of uh, Israel's direction. I think it tilts in favor of reality. Uh, that's perfectly obvious that Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, is Israel's capital. You can argue about East Jerusalem, and I'm sure they will later. But I, I don't think you can form a lasting, secure peace on soap bubbles. And the idea that the status of West Jerusalem is up for negotiation is just delusional. So I think it advances the cause of peace when you're realistic like that. And um, I think it's also a signal around the world that Trump said during the campaign, I'm going to do this. And, of course, so did a lot of other American presidents, and Trump did. And I said, good God, a politician who does what he says he's going to do, this is real trouble, isn't it? Yep. Last question is here. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I'm from South Korea, Seon Avenue, CSC. Um, the question is, is White House really considering bloody nose uh, uh, 
campaign. Uh, so uh, recently uh, in Minhae, Germany, uh, the Senator James Rich said there's no bloody no thing, but um, mass destruction, and that will be mass destruction. So, so what's your opinion on that? And is there any good way to minimize damage to lives and properties in South Korea if we have to attack uh, North Korea? Right. Well, I, I don't know what the planning is, so I, I can't I can't answer that question. I, I know what I what I have said and what my view is, and I think it's incumbent on the United States. Uh, to do whatever they can to minimize casualties for South Koreans, for Americans, for American troops who are in South Korea. But I think the, the question you have to ask is what's the cost-benefit trade-off to striking before North Korea gets nuclear weapons compared to what happens after they get nuclear weapons. And from the South Korean point of view, you know, I think uh, uh, it's, not, it's not a case where North Korea is just going to wake up one morning and Kim Jong-un will decide he's going to attack the United States. Uh, it's going to work like this. He's going to say, okay, uh, we, we believe in peaceful relations on the Korean Peninsula, and to help facilitate that, we want the immediate withdrawal of all American forces. And if we don't, you'll face consequences. A sea of fire across the peninsula. That's one of their favorite phrases. So if you have a weak American president who says, wait a minute, am I risking Los Angeles to keep 35,000 American troops in South Korea? We'll just move them back to Japan. Second day, Kim Jong-un says, well, that's a good, good first step, but we really believe in peace and security in East Asia. Remove them from Japan. You know, at some point, people have to recognize that North Korea wants nuclear weapons not for self-defense, but because they still want to reunify the Korean Peninsula under their control. Uh, and uh, given that it's a desperately poor country, the price they're going to get for selling nuclear and ballistic missile technology it really, it's going to be quite a profit center. They're going to make AQ Khan and the Pakistanis quite jealous of what they're up to. So I think that's why South Korea needs to face this question, too. And I understand, for obvious reasons, it's very divisive. But the long-term security of South Korea will be undermined severely if North Korea gets that deliverable nuclear weapons capability. Please join me in thanking Ambassador Charlie Bolton.